1570 WOCA. Ocala. All right, 25 minutes before 11 o'clock. What do you know about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln? Well, you probably know that John Wilkes Booth was uh, the person who pulled the trigger, the person who shot him. But did you know there were co-conspirators? And it's not a conspiracy theory. This is and not only is it factual, but there's ev- not evidence, but there's, there's records that some of the co-conspirators were actually hanged. I think his mother also was hanged. Not that she was in the theater Mm -hmm. at the time that John Wilkes... And I don't mean John Wilkes Booth's mother. I mean... Oh, never mind. See, I just messed (laughs) up. I just messed up. (laughs) I meant meant the name John Surratt. John Surratt's mother was hanged. Yes. I don't know anything about John Wilkes Booth's mother. Uh, But John Surratt is not even a name I knew. John Mm -mm. Surratt um, may have escaped anything. He may have gotten away scot-free. Michael Schein has written a book about this. The book is called John Surratt, The Lincoln Assassin Who Got Away. Uh, Michael is an historian. He's an attorney. He's a very popular speaker. He serves on the Speaker's Bureau of Humanities in Washington. He's the director of the annual uh, Lit Fuse Poetry Workshop and... uh, I am all ears with this subject. Uh, John Serac, good morning, sir. Hi, Larry. How are you? Good. I, I almost put the wrong mother to the wrong guy, so I apologize for that. I was, I was huh. jumping ahead. Uh, yeah, I never heard the name John Serac before. Did, did I fall asleep in class? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think most, of our, most people's walking around knowledge goes as far as John Wilkes Booth. Uh, but if you were, if you'd been alive 150 years ago, you certainly would have, because it was one of the most famous names around at that point. Wow. And and, and but, but am I right? He he nor was anybody else in the theater with John Wilkes Booth, right? John Wilkes Booth went to the theater by himself. Well, there was a dispute about that. Oh. John Surratt is an elusive character. He was a Confederate uh, spy. And there at his, he was ultimately captured in Italy, got away again, and then recaptured in Egypt, brought back for trial in 1867. And at his jury trial, it was a jury trial, wasn't a military trial like his mother got, um, there were 11 witnesses who placed him in D.C. on the date of the killing. But there were also five very persuasive witnesses who placed him over uh, nearly 300 miles away in Elmira, New York. Oh, my goodness. Now, the, can I ask you about the, the nature of the conspiracy itself? I, I don't. What, what I don't understand in this particular story is why was a conspiracy even necessary? I'm not, I'm not questioning it. I'm just wondering why. What, all it takes is one man with one gun in one theater? Why, why did you even need any conspirators? What did the other people do? Well, the plot... And, and, you know, I want to start with one thing very clear. This is not like the Kennedy assassination where the big question is, was there a conspiracy or not? As you've already alluded to, there's no question there was a conspiracy involving the Lincoln assassination. The only real question is, how far did it go and who was involved? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, one of the reasons is that it wasn't just a plot to kill Lincoln. It was a plot to kill Secretary of State Seward and Vice President Johnson, and there's, there's uh, some evidence that it also went against uh, Ulysses S. Grant, uh, Commander-in-Chief of the Army, so it was a plot to decapitate the Union government, and that, of course, would require a lot of coordination and, and uh, certainly more than one person. Right, right, right. What, what, back in those days, was the President not as protected as he is today? That's that's correct, and and Lincoln was a tough guy to protect too, because even when uh, those around him suggested that he needed protection, he he would laugh it off and just kind of uh, slip his guard and whenever possible. The the introduction of John Surratt into m- modern day uh, conversations, the one we're having, and the book the book is going to start a lot of conversations. Do you have you have you yet, or do you suspect to have anybody uh, contesting what the book says? 
not in broad outline, you know, uh, amongst historians, certainly we, we disagree over details, uh, but the broad outline is very solidly researched and, and uh, you know, based on a lot of original source documents, and so I'm, I'm quite confident with the research that we put into it. Now, there are times, and, and I, I try to be very clear about this in the book, where I'll say, we don't know. And I'll say, here's the evidence for one thing, and here's the evidence for the other thing. And you, the reader, look at it, and you can make up your own mind as to what you think. Oh, okay. When uh, you had said that he had even gone to uh, Italy, uh, we were told that he had even joined the Pope's army while he was there. That's right. And I've, I've looked at the enlistment record, and now it's under an alias. He used the alias John Watson. Uh, but there's really no question that he was there. When, when he was captured, he was wearing the uniform of the Papal Zouaves. And it's kind of hmm. an interesting story. It's a fanciful, elegant uniform. Uh, there's a picture of him on the cover of the book wearing it. It's got uh, uh, all this beautiful braiding and, and the crosses in red on the, on the front and this strange cap with a tassel and the whole works. And um, the Pope at that time was a uh, secular leader as well as being a religious leader, and he had an army, and, and Surratt enlisted in it. Wow. Uh, just real quick, almost on a side question, was the doctor who helped John Wilkes Booth uh, also found as a conspirator? Uh, Samuel Mudd, that's correct. He was tried. He was one of the eight who was tried. He was uh, sentenced to life in prison at hard labor and sent to uh, the, what was called the Dry Tortugas, the uh, Fort Jefferson. Oh, down here. Way down off, yeah, off the tip of Florida. Uh, wow. And, uh, and spent a few years there, and then he was pardoned by uh, one of the last acts in office of Andrew Johnson before he left office. Now, now looking back on, on as a historical thing, were the... Um the hangings of his of uh, John Sur Surratt's mother and and the, the gentleman you just said the doctor were, were they fair? I mean, was there anything that really ju justified executing those people? Well, I, I just mentioned uh, Doctor Mudd was not executed. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but but, but okay. Of, I'll, I'll take both questions. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the evidence against Doctor Mudd is disputed. Uh, Dr. Mudd said that he was just doing his job as a country doctor. This fellow came with a broken leg, and he, he splinted it. Right. Now, the reality is there's pretty strong evidence that Dr. Mudd, that Booth had been a guest at Dr. Mudd's house the previous November, that they'd gone out and bought a horse together. Hmm. Um, so he knew uh, John Wilkes Booth, and Dr. Mudd was a Confederate uh, a sympathizer and probably part of a communication route between Richmond and, and Washington, D.C. that was run. He was one of the safe houses. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that he was actually uh, guilty, and, and, and so that gets to Mary Surratt. And there's a lot of evidence um, that is disputed, but nonetheless the evidence that came in to the military tribunal had Mary Surratt uh, among other things, I won't go into all of it, we don't have time, but among other things, on the very day of the assassination, meeting with Booth, taking a package from him, which were some spy glasses that he used, going down to Surrattsville Tavern, which he owned down in Maryland, which was the first place Booth stopped the night of the assassination after escaping D.C., giving them to the proprietor, her tenant, John Lloyd, saying someone will be by to call for these tonight and also have the guns that John Surratt hid there, these carbines, have those guns ready that her son had hidden there mm. and have the whiskey ready for these guys. So that suggests that she was deeply in the plot. Got it. Know. Okay, wow. Who knew all this stuff? Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, now, there is still a, a question of whether um, um, having a military trial was fair, and the question of whether she should, whether Andrew Johnson should have commuted her sentence 
from death to life in, in prison, uh-huh. and that's pretty hotly contested. Uh, we're, we're learning about John Surratt and the other people who were involved in the Lincoln assassination. Uh, John, John Surratt is the name of the book. Uh, it is written by our guest, Michael Shine. We need to take a little break. Uh, Michael, am I saying your last name correctly? Shine, that's right. Shine. Okay, and where are you? Where are you calling from? Uh, I'm in a little town called Carnation, which is about 40 miles east of Seattle, Washington. Oh, my goodness. You're way out there. Okay. Well, let, let me uh, ask you to hold on just a little bit. We'll be right back. The phone is ringing, by the way. got a lot of people wanting to ask you questions, it looks like. So we'll take the calls and continue the conversation when we come back. The weather is brought to you by myfwc.com. Safe boating is no accident. Times of clouds and sunshine for today. We'll have a heavy thunderstorm around from late morning on. Warm with highs of 85 to 87. Partly cloudy tonight, low 68 to 70. Variable clouds tomorrow with an afternoon shower or thunderstorm and highs of 85 to 88. Intervals of clouds and sunshine, high 85 to 88 Saturday. From the Florida Weather Center, I'm Heather Zayer. Are you wasting hundreds or thousands of dollars on termite retreat fees? If you're not with Turner Pest Control, you probably are. Turner Pest Control offers the industry's only termite and pest control package that never charges retreat fees, ever. You can get started today for only $99. This is a value of $500 or more. This includes treatments, installation of monitoring stations, quarterly pest control, and a lifetime guarantee, all for an unbelievable low $99. Even if you have another pest control provider, visit turnerpest.com to find out how you can avoid paying those high termite retreat fees. Hi, I'm Seth with AA Lock, Dock, and Security. Have you ever thought about the locks or security on your house or business? Have you ever wondered why the keys to your new car cost so much? Well, at AA Lock, Dock, and Security, we can help with securing your valuables. We can even replace those expensive transponder keys. We can give you the knowledge that no one else will. Call AA Lock, Dock, and Security at 867-1965. That's 867-1965. Hello, gorgeous. Hi, this is Becky at Hello, Gorgeous Salon. We are located in the heart of downtown Ocala, right next to the historic Marion Theater. I'd like to invite you to stop by and see our new boutique area and meet our staff of professional stylists. Here at Hello Gorgeous, we are ready to update your look with the latest trends. It's the perfect time to brighten up your look. So make your appointment now for those highlights and Brazilian blowout. But don't stop there. We are a full service salon offering manicures, pedicures, and facials also. So if you've been searching for a salon to call your own, come and see us at Hello Gorgeous Salon. We are located at 48 South Magnolia Avenue in downtown Ocala, right next to the Marion Theater. So call today and set up your appointment at Hello Gorgeous Salon at 351-5358. That's 351-5358. And don't forget, we also do men and children's cuts too. 351-5358. Hello Gorgeous. All right, 12 minutes before 11 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, Let's see how I'm going to do on this test. I want to recap. Uh, Michael Shine is on the phone. He wrote the book John Surratt, The Lincoln Assassin Who Got Away. And let's see, he was one of the co-conspirators in the Lincoln assassination. He may have been or may not have been in the theater with John Wilkes Booth when the shooting took place. Uh, his mother seems to have been involved with the, the like the, the group of guys. Uh, I don't remember how many guys there were. Eight? Did I remember? Eight. Eight, eight guys. Uh, Michael Shine, good morning again, and I thank you for holding through the break. Um, so did, did he survive? I guess we'll get that out of the way, and then I'll go to the phone. Did, did he live to be an old man? He did. He, um, after there was a hung jury, eventually the charges against him were dropped, and he got a job as a clerk at a steamship company after a few other jobs, got married, had children, lived to a ripe old age, died in 1916. Wow. wow. And where, where did he live the rest of his life? Baltimore, Maryland. In Baltimore. Mostly. Okay. He had to be uh well and uh one more question um from from me. How high up did this conspiracy go? Did it go as high as Jefferson Davis? Well, that's the million dollar question. We've got circumstantial evidence that it did because uh Surratt, who was Booth's closest associate for the four months prior to the assassination, met he traveled down to Richmond and met with Judah Benjamin, who was Secretary of State of the Confederacy, and according to what Louis Weichmann, who was a a boarder at at, uh, Surratt's boarding house, said, 
John Surratt, when he got back from Richmond, told him that he also saw Jefferson Davis there. And wow. that was two weeks prior to the assassination. Wow. Would you like to have been a fly on the wall to hear what was said there? Oh, man. <laughs> That's one thing what I guess we'll David never... Been talking about? I guess we'll never know. All right, let me let me uh, be fair to the listeners. I, I know that you've got their attention, so let's go to take calls. And, and if you call right now and it's just ringing and ringing, I promise I'll get to it when I can. Good morning. Thank you for waiting. You're on the air with Michael Shine. Uh, thank you. This is really a privilege. Um, you know, there's very little doubt that somebody like Louis Payne, he was also known as Louis Powell, he's the one that attacked uh, Secretary Seward. There's no no doubt that he deserved, you know, to die as for his part in the plot. But I, I really think that if cooler heads had prevailed, uh, Mrs. Surratt might have avoided being uh, strung up with the rest of the conspirators. But in, in popular histories of the assassination, she's usually described somewhat harmlessly as a, uh, the woman who ran the boarding house where the conspirators met. And as our guest has pointed out, she was also a Confederate sympathizer, and she did act as some kind of a courier, as, as many of these men did. But I was going to ask our author, I've always heard that uh, Surratt claimed he was in Canada, and his mother said he was in Canada when, when the assassination actually happened. And I'll hang up and listen on you, but I would like to get the story on that, because when criminals change their story, as, as Dr. Mudd did, he changed his story, too, after he was implicated. When criminals change their story, that usually means they're guilty. So I'll uh, listen to our author. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks for that question. Um, and, and I'm sorry, I didn't catch, catch the call at the name, but he, he's obviously very informed. So uh, good question. Uh, John Surratt claimed all along that he was in Elmira, New York at the time. His alibi was that he was on a surveillance mission for the Confederacy uh, in plain clothes, so he was a spy in enemy territory. If he'd been caught, he could have been shot. Uh, but he was surveilling a prison where, con where Confederate prisoners of war were being held, and that was his alibi. And uh, Mrs. Surratt said he was, he'd gone to Canada, but that's really all she knew. She didn't probably know the details of what mission he was on. So there was nothing in place at that time to, like, like, like if he were to board a train, there would be no, like, no red flag that goes up, wait a minute, aren't you the guy we're looking for? Back in those days, there couldn't have been something like that, am I right? Well, when the, when the, after the assassination... Uh, and his picture was distributed, he had to get through a lot of detectives near the Canadian border up in St. Albans, Vermont. Uh, he was disguised as a Canadian, which sounds odd to us today, but back in those days, Canadians dressed sort of like Englishmen, and it was distinctive from the kind of dress that Americans wore. Oh, wow. And he said that he walked through town and a detective came over and stared him in the face and he just looked right back into his face and smiled and went on his way and he was a you know he was a cool cucumber and he was able to pass oh wow that's wow. so, that so fascinating um so in in the book did you write the book as a biography or, or um how, how how do we read the book I, I it hasn't arrived yet just so you know yeah it, it's not really a biography it's more a history of um, uh, these incredible events I mean it's, it's hard to characterize it that way it's a biography in one sense but I don't go through the all the details of his life after his after the hung jury I just summarize those in one chapter at the end I got you. because it's mostly focused on the events of the assassination the planning of the assassination and then his incredible escape and his journey of 5,000 miles across up to Canada, to Liverpool, to, to, uh, through France and down into Italy, and then ultimately to Alexandria, Egypt, and until he was finally captured. Of all places, Egypt. I just noticed in my notes that April 14th marked the 150th anniversary of the Lincoln assassination. Exactly, right. Uh, did did he have uh, was was uh, uh, Sarah Slater part of the conspiracy also? Oh, 
Oh, you raised the Sarah Slater question. Yes. <laughs> She's an interesting character. She's known as the Veiled Lady Spy because she always wore a veil. And uh, she, she was uh, uh, described as young and beautiful, and Surratt was very young at this time. He was 21 years old at the time of the assassination, and he was very handsome. And those two went to Richmond together in that two, that two weeks before the, the assassination. And she was carrying uh, dispatches for the Confederacy. We know she carried dispatches up to Canada for them several times. And their names appear together in the register of a hotel up in Montreal. So there's suspicion that there was not only some spying going on together, but also perhaps a romantic relationship. So they were true patriots then to the Confederacy? Oh, yes, absolutely. That was their allegiance. Hmm. Uh, so so he, he went on to live. Did he? Did he uh, you know, the one thing that kind of strikes me as wrong, I, I, not wrong in, in error, I don't mean that way, but I mean wrong on his part, is that he didn't go back and, and support his mother. I say, I would think, oh my gosh, they got my mom, I got to go back. And, yeah. and, you know, and I'll face the consequences, but I don't want my mom to be on trial. Yeah, Larry, and you really hit on a strong point there because that he was very much criticized for that, and he was um, defensive about it and very closed about it and always blamed others, saying that when he was hiding in Canada, people were who were handling him didn't give him full information of the peril his mother was in. But I've picked that story apart pretty thoroughly, and and I think it's something that was was shameful and that he always had a very guilty conscience about afterwards. So he went, he went on and he lived to 1916, you said? It, did he get remarried? And are there... Did, did he leave any re on his deathbed? Did he say, oh, by the way, I was there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no. He played his cards close to the chest. In fact, um, he was supposed to be working on a memoir in the later years, and then, according to family lore, uh, about a month before he died, he took all his papers and everything and threw them into the furnace. His, oh my gosh. his middle name was Harrison, and there's probably no connection, but, but I'll ask anyway. Is there a connection to either of the ha Harrisons that were presidents? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, I, and, I've, and I've checked his family back through a little bit. So I don't think so. But, you know, a genealogist could, could get me on that. I'm not a specialist in that. Right. right. Uh, according to your uh, bio, sir, that you've taught American legal history, what is the difference between teacher, teaching American legal history and teaching American history? Uh, well, it focuses on on the development of the law and significant cases and and, and, in, and their interplay with historical events. Uh, I always taught it as a history class, um, but it, I mean, I taught it at a law school to to law students, and so you can. I mean, there's this great interplay in American history between politics and law. Most political events become legal challenges at some, at, you know, at some point. Mm -hmm. And so you can look at uh, the evolution of history through the lens of the legal challenges. Oh, this is so fascinating. Uh, let's see, I found the book on uh, Amazon, and uh, I'm guessing it's available everywhere. Um, 1895 for the paperback on Amazon, <laughs> if, you want, if you want to buy it on Amazon. Do you have a website, uh, Michael? Yes, michaelshine.com is my general website for, for all my books, and there's also a particular website that has some more information and images about Surratt called johnsurratt.com. You know what's amazing to me, the photography. I mean, I, I guess I just wasn't aware that photography was that, that as, as common as apparently it was. I, I would think that, a, that you'd have to be really rich to be able to have a, f a photograph back in those days. Mm hmm no, it was, um, I think the photography started to come about in the 1840s and 1850s. So by the 1860s, there were um, studios available in most cities where you could go, you know, take the family down and, and get some photographs taken. And it wasn't, you know, uh -huh. it wasn't nothing, but it was reasonably priced and 
and middle class families could do that. I just didn't. And the Civil War was the first comprehensively photographed war. Um, the images from the battlefields are available. Right. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for being on the air with us. We are out of time. Uh, thank you. What a wonderful story. For the listeners, when the books arrive that are normally sent to us, we'll, we'll let you know. We'll give that one away. Yes. Thank you, Michael. We'll be right back. Fox News Radio. I'm Joe Chiuro. He flew in under the radar. Until his wheels got up, I didn't think he was going to do it. And, and then uh, beyond that, until he like flies over the buildings on, you know, over